everyone, how are we doing? Good. Wonderful. Good. <laughs> Kayla? Good. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm going to go ahead and shut my door. We can go ahead and get started with today's conversation. And why don't we start off with introductions? Um, Kayla, can you start us off with those really quickly? Just your name, your pronoun, what you're bringing to today's conversation. Sure. Um, I'm Kayla. I use she or they pronouns. Um, I'm currently calling in from Ho Chunk Land, also known as Madison, Wisconsin. I'm a network organizer with the PowerShift Network. And I've been involved in just transition and energy democracy work since high school when I worked with the Kentucky Student Environmental Coalition. So a lot of my energy expertise is focused on Kentucky. Um, I'll pass it to Lily. Hi, I'm Lily. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm with the Green Neighbor Challenge. I do research and communications and a lot of other things, whatever needs to be done um, that I'm interested in working on. Um, and I'm calling in from uh, Minneapolis on Dakota land. Um, and I'll pass it to Saren. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Saren Glenn. I use they, them pronouns. I'm currently calling from so-called Massachusetts. Um, and I work for the PowerShift Network and political education um, and training. So I'm the political education and trainings coordinator. Um, and I'm here not only to be a wonderful facilitator, but to also offer um, different perspectives and different openings from different walks of life in regards to energy democracy and how this can become a really important offshoot to tackling the larger climate crisis as a whole. Andrew, would you love to close this for us? Yeah, um, so Andrew, he, him, his, um, I'm the founder of the, the Green Neighbor Challenge, calling in from Sun Prairie, um, also uh, Ho-Chunk land, Sun Prairie, uh, Wisconsin, I should say. Um, and yeah, I think uh, I'm just, I'm excited to talk about energy today and I've got a lot to say. So I'll leave it at that. Awesome. So as Andrew mentioned, and a few of us previously, this is a webinar all about energy democracy. What is it? Why do we need it? Why is it important? How does it affect us? And what does it really mean? Um, I would love to kind of start off this conversation uh, with the introduction to the slides that you all have around like what is energy democracy, just kind of building that foundation before we hop into the larger presentation. Lily, you want to field that first? Oh, uh, we're not sharing your slides yet. Oh, um. <laughs> oh, no, you can. You absolutely can share the slides. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, but I mean, just thinking about energy democracy as sort of, you know, currently the energy system is sort of run by and for, you know, certain capitalist powers, um, you know, fossil fuel companies, utility companies, and the people who use energy are not necessarily in charge of the, the decisions around it. And that's become quite obvious lately, um, especially with what's happening in Washington. And so energy democracy, what I think of it as sort of moving towards, um, you know, a redistribution of power to control our energy system and um, have the people make decisions that would benefit us and all of our future, like accelerating the tr transition to green energy. Um, and just like giving people the tools and the knowledge to be able to do that and to be able to transform the system. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the part that I'd add is, to me, and it, it's really an, energy democracy is an answer to the question of how do we build energy systems that respond to community needs and community desires. That's, to me, the heart of it. Yeah. And I think I'll add that energy democracy to me means reclaiming um, our relationship to our neighbors um, that has been stolen from us, largely from capitalism, that has taught us that we shouldn't be working together, that we don't have power as a people or as a neighborhood. And so I think of energy democracy as being one of the first steps 
for us to become resilient as communities. And then that's how we get to abolition. That's how we get um, to <laughs> destroying poverty. That's how we get to taking care of one another. And so I see energy democracy as really being one of uh, the stepping stones to all the other ways we can um, promote justice in our neighborhoods. Great. Aaron? I was just going to say I loved all of those answers um, and I think a little perspective on energy democracy from someone who doesn't work in energy systems um, but who's learned so much on this journey with you all coming up to this webinar is more than anything when I think of energy democracy I think of a cultural shift and the way that we look at energy right realizing that it is something that we as a community can take ownership of realizing that it's something to be valued realizing that it doesn't just come out of the ground or electrical you know units but more so energy the energy that we as people use for production for labor you know i think there's an even bigger conversation about energy across different formats and the way that we can democratize our own personal energy in the same way so very excited to continue this journey yeah <clears throat> um and uh i just i really want to i think before i start to is just like give a shout out to everyone who came um, a lot of gratitude for you guys taking the time, especially on short notice, to come join this conversation because it really does, if we're going to achieve energy democracy, it takes all of us. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> we've done a little bit of introductions uh, already. I'll just kind of throw out, um, I'm, I'm a lifelong asthmatic, grew up not far from a coal plant myself in Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin. Um, I developed my sort of love of the environment as well as just learning and teaching through uh, the scouting program part of my backgrounds in film analytics and then public policy which kind of informed different parts of the green neighbor challenge the green neighbor challenge started as a, as a master's paper while i was in grad school um, and then i'm also an active organizer with science for the people Lily, you want to um, yeah, so I used to want to be a comedian i gave up on that dream um, because i you know, saw the world around me falling apart and wanted to figure out how to be a part of fixing it. Um, so I went back to school for public policy and that's where I met Andrew. Um, and I'm really interested in, you know, the intersections of social and environmental problems and solutions. Um, and yeah, I've been with Green Neighbor Challenge for like a year and a half um, because I really believe in it and yeah. That's all. Right. Um, and so I just want to lay out some goals um, and maybe probably the most important is the expectations, but um, I've got a, an unfortunately massive amount of slides prepared. Uh, <laughs> and I'm probably going to have to go through them quickly. Um, but we'll be covering, you know, hopefully getting folks to understand the impacts and interconnections of our energy system, developing a sense of what energy democracy means understanding the sort of electrify everything strategy that underpins really our path forward, seeing how energy uh, electric markets and electric policies both kind of intershape and intersupport one another. And then um, getting you introduced to the Green Neighbor Challenge is a brand new green pricing web tool. Um, but yeah, uh, ultimately, I think my goal is to, I'm gonna expose you to a lot of ideas, a lot of concepts, a lot of information, a lot of links even. Um, and hoping that you all leave with curiosity to return to this slide deck, investigate those links, investigate those concepts, because we just, I've only got, you know, we got 90 minutes with you uh, at best. So we're gonna move quickly. So first we start with the harms. So one, you know, to me, one of the biggest things, you, we often talk about climate and carbon and these things in the future, uh, the the this this headline the new consensus um, I think one of the biggest things that I wish more people understood about our energy system is the massive amount of health harm that we are all bearing from our collective energy system the catastrophe has been with us all along um, from this recent Vox article it points out the air quality benefits arrive much sooner than the climate benefits they are at least for the next several decades much larger. They can be secured without the cooperation of other countries, 
And by generating an average of $700 billion a year and avoided health and labor costs, they will more than pay for the energy transition on their own. And just to highlight $700 billion a year, that's 7 trillion over 10 years. And we're debating about whether or not we can afford 3.5 trillion um, right now. And it also further says, if the numbers are shocking, it's because the science has been developing rapidly. And I can really attest to that. A lot of this new epidemiological studies have just come out in the last five, 10 years. Um, and so we're really learning a lot about how much damage um, all these emissions are doing to us. And so, yeah, um, when we, the most damaging part, um, largely, uh, at least of the uh, main parts of our energy system come from coal and burning coal. When we burn coal, it's releasing particulate matter, which is soot, gets caught in our lungs, nitrogen oxide, which is smog, it's actually caustic to our, to our lung lining, sulfur dioxide, which turns into acid in the atmosphere, and uh, acid rain acidifies um, our soils, acidifies our water, makes the ecology less habitable. Mercury comes out of it, lead, arsenic, those are all poisonous to humans. Um, volatile organic compounds, which is uh, ozone, also caustic to the lungs and often triggers uh, asthma attacks and uh, other respiratory illnesses. Carbon monoxide and di dioxide, as you know, as well as cadmium and other heavy medical metals, which are uh, cancer causing. So really, you know, one of the things that, that science is really coming to is uh, all these emissions are really invisible killers and they go by different names. They go by lung cancer, they go by stroke, they go by heart disease, they go by lung disease, asthma, bronchitis, et cetera. Um, but we don't call them really by their true name. And so in the US um, for context, combustion related pollution kills about 85,000 people annually, at least that we know of. Um, <clears throat> at least that's as far as the models have gotten and they're likely to get worse and demonstrate more. And then worldwide, there was a massive multinational study and it basically found that about one in six deaths worldwide are caused by um, combustion related pollution. So I think it's really important for us to grapple with the health. And then of course, our energy system is deeply racialized like most, most other systems. Look at um, people of color in the US, 57% live in counties that received uh, a failing grade for either ozone or particulate pollution compared to 38% of whites. Um, whites experience 17% less air pollution than they produce. Um, Blacks and Hispanics comparatively bear 56 and 63% more air pollution, respectively. Um, asthma affects Blacks at a 36% higher rate than whites. And then Blacks are hospitalized for asthma three, at three times the rate and die of asthma at twice the rate of whites. And Black and white households paid similar utility bills, but Black households experience a median energy burden 64% greater than white households. Um, and when we, you know, a lot of this arises of like, where do we cite the pieces of our energy system? Um, and where our coal plants go um, are often in uh, communities of color. Um, and so as we talk about transitioning, fortunately, I mean, there's, we've gotten to this point where we have such a deeply inequitable system that as we start dismantling it, um, the, there's huge benefits to the communities that then are experiencing this remediation. So a look at Jefferson County in Kentucky, um, they had one coal fired plant shut down and three others upgraded their emission control. So they didn't even wipe out all the coal plants, but they ended up seeing 400 asthma related hospital visits uh, prevented in that first year with an average reduction of inhaler use of about 17%. They actually had RFID trackers inside of inhalers to track this usage real time. Um, which is super cool and kind of a, a groundbreaking study. <clears throat> also, in terms of uh, property values, is there in another area they saw a 37% increase in homes within 1.2 miles where coal plants were switched over to gas plants. So they went they did, again, didn't even get rid of the power plant, but just switched from coal to gas. And there was a huge uh, value of um, property value increases. And then uh, it says our back of the envelope calculations suggest that coal to gas fuel switching led to a $1.7 billion property value gain across the 300,000 homes in the immediate vicinity of the, the 10 plants that they were looking at. Um, and then, you know, what, I, what, I, what this all starts to converge to is there's really a, a nexus of our economy, our energy, and our health converging. 
um, that we really need to, um, the transition tries to remediate. So this is before the pandemic, all these stats from 2015, 55% of households can't replace a month of lost income. 47% would have to borrow or sell something to cover a $400 emergency expense. 31% of households face a challenge paying their energy bills or sustaining adequate heating or cooling. 22%, so it's one in five, had to forego food or medicine to pay an energy bill in a year. 6% face that decision every single month. And 14% of households received a disconnection notice for energy service. You know, that's in the richest country in the world pre-pandemic. Um, and, and so when we look at like, what is this costing us? Is the air pollution burden from combusted fuels was about $1,200 to $1,300 per person in the US in 2018, which is more than a third of the price of energy itself. So this is, this is the quantifying the externalities of, of our energy system. And of course, um, all of this pressure is, uh, falls on those on the lowest rungs. So the bottom fifth of income groups pay an average of 33% of their income towards healthcare already. So if you're choosing between healthcare, food, energy, you know, this is really the state of uh, America that we live in. <clears throat> and, um, you know, this is not too, too um, short climate catastrophe either, because we know that um, right, right now it's projected about one third of the U.S. population will be experiencing extreme weather events annually by 2050 um, if we continue to let greenhouse gases uh, rise the way they are. That's more than doubling what we're experiencing now. So if you think this last year was great, imagine twice that, um, maybe more. And, um, you know, again, the cost factors since 1980, the U.S. has sustained $1.8 trillion in losses from climate related disasters. And, you know, I mean, 1980 is a long time ago. The effect wasn't that great. It just keeps ramping up and, and uh, really accelerating in a dangerous way. <clears throat> and then, um, of course, too, as I, I like to mention, you know, we're always bombarded with like vote climate, vote climate. And there's a lot of focus on federal elections. But that tends to drive disengagement. I, I find, at least on climate issues, one in four residents are ineligible to vote. One in three choose not to vote. Um, only you know, less than 10% of house districts were considered competitive in 2020, and less than 12 or just 12 states were considered swing states. And so, really, when we talk about you know federal, um, we need to we need to do a lot deeper work of fixing gerrymandering, segregation, voter restrictions, and disenfranchisement. Um, and I think we need to put a lot more emphasis and focus on local and state power, which I think has been purposefully obscured from us. Um, so historically, only a quarter of residents um, vote in local elections. In the last 15 years, 20% of local newspapers have been shut down. Staffing levels with those that survived were cut in by more than half. And as a result, we now see that in local papers, only 17% of articles written are local. The rest are getting, you know, just re brought syndicated posts, basically. And televisions, even worse. Um, one, one corporation, Sinclair, now owns 40% of local news stations. And <clears throat> from before and after, they increased the national coverage by 25% directly at the expense of local political coverage. And there's these really cool really sharp correlations that actually show that local political competition and engagement goes down as newsroom staffing declines, is when there's less conversation and less ability to see the difference between local candidates, um, elections become uh, less, less uh, <clears throat> contentious. And there was this great quote from this, this study, it said, after years without a strong local voice, our community does not know itself. And so I think it's important for us to think about the information ecology too of all of this. Um, and uh, you know, the net result now, I mean, there's, there's some good news, I guess, in this, which is that more than one, one in four Americans are um, alarmed and taking personal action in their, their everyday life. And climate alarm has doubled in the last five years alone. So. There's a lot of movement. A lot of people are really waking up and starting to take action. Um, and overall, over half Americans believe climate action is urgently needed. <clears throat> a few words about um, some of the benefits. I can't. I couldn't even count them all if I wanted. But uh, there's huge benefits of renewables. So wind 
when manufacturing, it's everywhere. It's all across America. It's all in South Carolina. To call South Carolina a coal state is kind of funny to me when you look at this map. Um, so switching to renewables, it stimulates manufacturing, construction, and maintenance jobs, often in rural areas, which really need development. Um, also in terms of, you know, there's a lot of talk about the land that's used, the average um, small solar, so per acre, and a farmer can make uh, $30,000 a year on an acre of solar, which expands local tax revenues. And for comparison, um, compared to growing corn, for example, or renting, renting your land out to have something grown on it, farmers, landowners see up to four times the revenue from solar than they would renting it out for corn. So about $1,000 an acre per year, which is a really good haul for a uh, farmer and supporting kind of local uh, economies. And ecologically, there's this really cool relationship is um, <clears throat> when you find out 40% of corn grown in the US is used for ethanol. So we are essentially growing our energy right now. It's a huge, all our, you know, so much of our gasoline um, is actually just corn. And so we are mining the ground, um, as it were, mining the soil for energy through corn. And per acre, solar can produce the same amount of energy on a 15th to 128th the amount of land. So we can basically free up huge, huge amounts of uh, the US for conservation, um, about 19 million acres worth of land, in fact. And when you start to combine solar with native plantings, you can expand pollinator habitats, improve nearby crop yields. Um, having um, the plantings underneath solar panels actually increases their efficiency by lowering the, the ambient temperature. Um, it improves water quality and quantity by increasing um, <clears throat> the amount of uh, water recharge that gets absorbed into the ground and filtering it as it, as it does that, providing shaded grazing for cattle, um, as well as uh, you can use it to restore existing brown fields. And so there's this really cool intersection that's really starting to be explored in lots of different ways between renewables and re regenerative agriculture. So even when we start talking about food, <clears throat> there's these opportunities to you know, use panels for where there's grazing. Um, using panels, uh, I had to throw in mushrooms. Uh, growing mushrooms under solar panels is uh, a really great way because then they're in permanent shade, as well as combining with pollinators and uh, vegetable crops. Arizona is really excited um, and doing a lot of study about this to save uh, water because the water doesn't evaporate as quickly off the land. Um, huge benefits. Did you want to chime in and say something, Saren, about Mushrooms? Just, you know, mark those words, Andrew, mushrooms are going to be a really important part of our ecological transformation uh, in this upcoming 50 to 100 years. For sure. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, so in summary, just energy touches everything. It touches food, it touches water, it touches land. It, it's, it's, it is essential to our way of life. So kind of with that, we really, this is our first little reflection, I think, or I could turn over to Sarah, but what are some of the ways that you see energy justice touching your work or your life? What's surprising you? Drop it into the Q&A or chat. I'd also encourage panelists to answer this question in their own way um, while we wait for audience members to engage. <clears throat> I can go ahead and start, and I think for me, the obvious one for folks who don't know, I do power shift work, you know, on a formal level, I work in supporting community organizations uh, to make sure that they have the tools and resources that they need to accomplish the things that they want to accomplish in their communities. And on the other hand, I'm also a mushroom farmer, <laughs> so <laughs> I um, find that energy justice is an obvious one on both ends, whether it's the most recent conversation we had about mushrooms playing a role in solar panels and under solar panels and that new kind of um, system that we're creating of benefits, or it's looking at how climate tragedies and, um, you know, energy issues affect direct individuals all over the country that we might work with. My home state's Texas. Uh, and I'm sure all of us are very aware about Texas's grid issue um, that happened in the last freeze of last year. And I know a lot of people who 
I mean, their entire worlds were rocked because of that happening. That was a direct cause because of the climate situation that we're in. And had our energy systems been democratized in a way that didn't privatize or exclude um, individuals from being able to have a say-so in where their energy went and how they accessed it, there would have been a lot more families and a lot more individuals who, you know, wouldn't have died, wouldn't have gotten hurt, wouldn't have lost their homes, wouldn't have lost toes. I know a lot of diabetic elderly people who unfortunately their lives were forever changed because of that single moment. Um, and so I, I think it's important that we think about how energy and access to energy, right, affects, like you said, every single person, every single avenue. Um, so I will leave, leave it at that. Yeah, I mean, my my work with the Green Neighbor Challenge is obviously centered around a lot of um, energy research and like utility company research specifically, but also just as a person, I live in terror of climate change every single day. Um, and I'm like Andrew is going to cover in the next few slides, but our energy system is really a driver, the driver of climate change and transforming it is also one of the main solutions to climate change and i'm also like very interested in like the ecological impacts of agriculture and the like ecological destructiveness of our agriculture system and so i love the like combination of solar panels and agroecology and like land restoration and the potential there for like multi-solving and creating a system that like is regenerative and restorative while also meeting our needs instead of you know just being destructive and profiting like creating profits for a few while creating like a climate apocalypse for the rest of us There's some commentary in the chat that I'd love to take a second to read really quickly. Um, Jill Cartwright was was really um, explicit, I guess, in, in their comment. They stated that some older Black rural community leaders in South Carolina use solar panels to produce clean water for their communities, since like disasters plus poor city management cause neglect um, and boil water advisories are always on the regular. And I say explicit because that is something that is so like detailed and close to the type of communities that I come from that I often don't hear talked about because it's often an issue that tends to plague black communities um, or low income communities, communities of color a lot of the times and that like really hit me when you said the like water boil um, advisories because I grew up my whole life on, you know, living in a trailer in East Texas with water boil advisories, knowing that my dad worked for the um, water department, you know, and so it's, it's so interesting. Um, Maria Solomon stated that they work for a housing advocacy organization in Kentucky and energy impacts the housing crisis in so many ways. Um, Sakara rising electricity slash water um, to pay like for rent, environmental justice, air quality, housing prices in the area, sacrificing. Thank you. Sacrificing. I was like Sakara rising. Maybe that's just something I'm not familiar with. That's okay. Teach me something today. Uh, and then I uh, didn't want to skip over Craig Nielsen, who stated that they are proud that they are focused on hydroelectric power infrastructure. Their area has a focus on hydroelectric power infrastructure, which is also something that I think um, oh, if if we could, and I, I'm not educated enough, but I'm sure there's something on the rise around being able to harness these upcoming water-based uh, climate energy vortexes that we sometimes identify as hurricanes or tsunamis, which you want to name them, but being able to harness the energy that's created there in that ocean to somehow utilize it as a um, energy producer, right? Uh, I have no idea what that looks like, but I'm interested. <laughs> 
Kayla, yeah. I was curious, um, or Andrew, if you wanted to speak on this question. Uh, well, I was just going to say regarding the, the water events, weather events, is it's, it's better when they're slow and steady rather than intermittent and fierce uh, for, for getting energy out of them. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll just say like really quickly, I mean, in Kentucky, coal is so tied to the decline of such a large part of our state. Um, and the fact that people have just been manipulated into thinking that coal will make a comeback when it's so clear that it's not. Um, and so I think I see energy justice as like honesty and reclamation of land and reclamation of like identity and community. I also wanted to just uh, thank Maria for for bringing up the like housing connection, which I don't think we cover in this presentation, but it's also a huge interaction, especially like when it comes to housing that's more affordable for like low income communities. It's often like the least energy efficient and like the least well insulated, which causes their energy bills to be even higher and also causes like a lot of health impacts because it's usually, you know, colder in their houses um, because they can't afford to like keep it insulated and like reduce you know the the amount of energy they're using to to heat and everything else they need so uh it's it's a major problem that intersects with so many different aspects of our horribly unjust system Well, we will have another uh, discussion point soon. Um, I'm going to, if we don't mind, move <clears throat> us into this next section, which is really, let's, you know, opening up what is energy democracy? What does this look like? You know, we talked about harms and the benefits and the interconnections. And really, I think, you know, uh, at the center of this is um, agency. How do we give people power again? Um, you know, we're confronted on all sides for uh, climate, health, economy, politics, um, and really the questions I think a lot of people need answered as we try to bring them into the movement are is these four questions of where do I start? What are the important actions? How do I do them and what impact will it make? That's part of how we start to get people in and, and moving towards energy democracy. And then when we look at, you know, how do we actually define it? We, we had a bit of a conversation about this earlier. There's many possible definitions, solidarity, has one. Um, so they say creating just energy systems and in the process, if you are impacted by a decision about energy, you should get a voice in that decision. People are always put ahead of profit and input is highly valued. It means building an energy system that prioritizes energy efficiency, clean and renewable energy sources, local control, education, and information. And they also have then subset definitions of self-determination and sustainability. Uh, the thing I usually, uh, or that I kind of highlight is I think there's sort of three ingredients, which is the community knowledge, building that depth, um, community power, um, being able to exercise that knowledge and uh, ability, and then community specific solutions, things that are responsive to the local conditions um, and build on local resources. And that's sort of the what, I think too, is it's also important to look at it in terms of the how. And so I see the how as really, uh, uh, the how of democracy itself is relationships is, is one key piece of relationships to ourselves, relationships to each other and relationships to the planet. And that, you know, these are things that take really functionally a lifetime to build and get, um, get right. And I think, you know, it's, it's really deep work. Uh, second is capacities how do we get the skills and knowledge really distributed among people in a broad way? So it's not, it doesn't default to a technocracy where there's a few people making all the decisions. And, and, and finally, I don't think it gets talked about enough in organizing is, is processes of building institutional processes, building deliberative processes and building decisive processes to make sure that people don't get left out, that concerns aren't overridden. Um, what are we doing to really build the processes of democracy? And oftentimes this, um, a corollary to that is rules to protect fairness, um, to protect people from gaining too much power in those processes. And so Green Neighbor Challenge, um, you know, our sort of theory of change is meeting people where they're at and moving them along a continuum of first, yes, we want to tackle the system, get 
the emissions out of the system, get renewables. A lot of those are very large scale sorts of transitions. And so the next question is, how do we get people more involved in distributed energy, rooftop solar, community solar, or even pushing for municipally owned assets where the, the economic benefits start to accrue to the community? And then thirdly, really getting people in the mindset um, and the practice of energy democracy, of defining new visions of what our energy system should look like. So with that, the next kind of question here is, what do you think of when you think of fostering democracy? What comes to mind? And where are some examples of where you've seen deep democracy in action? Panelists, any thoughts to weigh in? Yeah, I can go first. And just like the last question, if you wanna add into the chat, we would love to hear from your all's wisdom as attendees as well. Um, but yeah, I'd like to give an example um, from Eastern Kentucky. Um, and I'll preface by saying that as Andrew stated before, one third of American households struggle to pay their energy bills, but 40 to 60% of uh, the energy we use could be saved just by retrofitting our houses. Um, and that the reason that we are not taught or know about that is because the energy corporations don't want us to know that because it's in their interest to make us spend as much energy as possible. So one of the easiest ways to engage with energy democracy is simply retrofitting your house because it pays off so quickly um, at, at, um, at an individual and neighborhood level. Um, so with coal at, on its way out um, in 2015, a group of quieter old people in Benham, Kentucky decided and they, they were a long time, their grandparents were coal miners, they were coal miners, and they saw their kids and their grandkids leaving Kentucky because coal was basically making it where it was economically unviable to stay in the community that they have stayed in for generations. And so they decided, you know what, we need to take it into our own hands um, and uh, find our own community power to do something other than coal. And so they started a program called Benham Saves with their utility company, and they get to retrofit their houses and the utility company pays it up front. So they don't lose any money. They do nothing but save and they get their houses retrofitted for free and they're getting that 40 to 60% savings back. But that is because they did the hard organizing work with their utility company which is a cooperative and they had power over um, and were able to get those savings for themselves and save energy and also reduce poverty um, in their communities. Um, but, and I think it's around 40% of our energy right now, our energy lines are owned by um, power cooperatives, which means that we as people have the power to make a change in those cooperatives, but we don't know it because they just purposely make um, accessing those spaces difficult. So there's this organization called Rural Power Coalition, and they help people um, fight their cooperatives that they're a part of and reclaim their membership status that is in the bylaws that they have. And they fought several dozen fights and they have never lost. So when you think about like, efficiency, right? Like we spend so much money and so much time fighting our politicians when we could just be fighting our utility companies, which is a way easier battle to fight. Um, and at the last example, I guess a metaphor that I'll give is in Benham, Kentucky, their number one tourist attraction is their coal museum. And the coal museum has solar panels on the roof. Um, and it saves them thousands of dollars every year. It saves the museum. And so I think that's like a good metaphor of like how people power can really create like a just transition. And I'm gonna drop in the chat as well, um, the People Utilities Justice Playbook, which is a really good primer to understanding like how utility companies are at fault for this and how to fight your utility company. Yeah, that's a wonderful resource I'll be talking about. I actually think I'll cite it a couple of times later. All right, well, any other thoughts out there? 
and I will continue moving forward. I may start accelerating in pace. Um, so just to give you the big picture, um, right now electricity is the largest share closely tied with uh, transportation for where our carbon emissions are coming from. Um, and then followed by industry, residential and commercial buildings, and then agriculture. And keep in mind, these wedges are with the electricity all pulled out of them. Um, <clears throat> but really the key thing is we have, to, we have to decarbonize our electricity first to really decarbonize those other sectors. Um, getting, uh, switching all of our electricity over to renewables is um, then allows us to electrify everything else. So electrifying our heating, our locomotion, our industrial processes. And that, that's really ultimately the key of how we're going to um, decarbonize. And one of the big benefits of this is as we electrify things, um, another phrase that's often thrown around is beneficial electrification, is that as we were mentioning is electrification drives huge efficiency savings. We're not losing, when you combust things, you lose a lot of energy to heat. There's so much energy wasted. And so there's actually uh, a future where we can significantly reduce the amount of energy usage that our economy needs um, as we electrify things as well. Again, improving the air we're breathing. And um, another thing is when we look at electricity and look at it sector by sector, residential sector is actually um, by little margin, the biggest sector. And it's often the most overlooked, um, whether you're looking at nonprofits, government programs, grants, other efforts, is they focus on the commercial and industrial uh, users because they see them as low hanging fruit. There's only a few people to deal with. And so I think there's a huge opportunity for organizers to engage residents and really start to reimagine this system because we have to, we have to organize residents um, to achieve energy democracy. And really, I think one of the key benefits of working with residents is shifting the Overton window. And so that's a political concept. Um, there's an excerpt about it is if Otto von Bismarck, who once said, politics is the art of the possible, the Overton window represents the limits of what is currently possible. Shifting that window then becomes the task of an activist. An important point is that politicians themselves are rarely the ones to do it. In our understanding, politicians typically don't determine what is politically acceptable. More often, they react to it and validate it. Generally speaking, policy change follows political change, which itself follows social change. The most durable policy changes are those that are undergirded by strong social movements. So really, I think part of our task as activists is how do we shift this Overton window by getting more people engaged in energy? And as we get people engaged, we need to, I think, both understand the policy of it and the economics of it. So first, a little bit about the economics. Um, big takeaway here is the price of wind energy has fallen 70% in the last decade. The price of solar has fallen 89% in the last decade. And only 80% of Americans believe that the cost of renewables or 80% of Americans believe cost of renewables have gone up. And only 20% even believe it's gone down. And I think most of those who believe it's gone down don't realize the extent that it's gone up. So this is, this is when I talk about the deep knowledge that we need to engender, these are, these are the sorts of, I think, energy 101 that really needs to be disseminated among the public. Um, and when you start to talk about you know, the cost of renewables has dropped so much, it's now the you know, cheapest sources of energy. People often retort, well, why, why aren't all the utilities building it? Uh, and part of it comes down to the existing infrastructure that's already built out is when they're doing their financial models, they're saying, well, the marginal cost of us using our coal plant is just the coal that we shovel into it. The plant's already built. The cost has already been spent. And so we're actually at this really uh, fascinating tipping point where the cost of building new renewables is now getting cheaper than the cost of fuel in existing resources. And so we are actually hitting this, this really rapid tipping point. And I think it's really important. The, the quicker we can accelerate this, this, put more downward pressure on these prices, um, we're gonna see a very, very rapid, uh, I think, switch over to the new way of doing business. And part of, part of this happens too um, through what's known as economic dispatches. Every, every five minutes, regional, um, markets of electricity are dispatching resources. Do we need this plant on, turn this plant off? Um, when you build renewables, the marginal cost is zero. So they're 
always operating. They always get dispatched because there's no cost to operating them. And then it's only as the price of electricity is driven up when there's more demand that we start to dispatch more expensive resources like peaker plants and coal. And so when we put renewables on the grid, um, there's, there's a good reason to believe that peaker plants tend to stay in place because they're very, very flexible. They can flip on and off in minutes, hours. Coal plants take a few days to really become effective and efficient, uh, ramping up and ramping down. So they're the first ones to actually get utilized less as we put more renewables on the system. And that's good news for everyone who breathes air, I think. Um, and one concept I really wanna leave you with when we talk about economics is the idea of stranded assets is right now, because this transition is happening where renewables will be cheaper to build than the marginal cost of operating our existing infrastructure, investor-owned utilities are in a rush to justify building as much fossil fuel infrastructure as they can. Because in monopoly states, which is about 75% of states, when a utility gets permission to build a capital investment, like a plant, they get guaranteed return on investment on that for 30 years usually from ratepayers. So they're trying to build plants that we won't need 10 years from now because 10 years from now, they'll be forced to build renewables and they'll also get to collect on those. And so there's, I think we have to understand, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, why, if it's cheaper, are utilities doing this? Because they make more money. They get to collect more money. They get to double dip and collect from ratepayers rate twice for an energy system we should really only be building once. Um, and so really, we're in, the, we're in a battle of infrastructure. We have to both accelerate green generation and it's important for us to stop these fossil projects that don't make sense and won't make sense in, you know, I mean, frankly, they don't make sense now. So uh, when we look at market levers, um, some, some folks may be happy to learn. I think a lot of people think it's worse than this, but green energy is 20%. So that's something, that's one in, one in five uh, electrons. And when we look at green energy, about 74% of it is being driven by mandatory requirements. So that's states saying utilities have to meet the renewable portfolio standards. 26% is voluntary, could be bigger. Um, the way that's all tracked is through RECs. RECs are sort of the currency tracking green energy because when you put an electron on the grid, all of them look the same. So RECs are how we kind of track um, who has the right to green energy. And so RECs are tradable certificates representing one megawatt hour of green energy. They're the legal claim to the environmental and social benefits. They're created when green energy is put on the grid. They're retired when someone wants to make a claim of their usage. And they can also expire, um, though the rules vary widely across states about expiration. And the key thing to know about RECs is that they ensure that there's no double counting of green energy claims. There are regional organizations that track the organization status and facilitate the trading, and they're used to certify market products and also these regulatory requirements. So in a cool way, RECs link both policy action and market action together. And there's seven forms of voluntary procurement. Kind of skip over this to, to say there's seven, but really only four of them can apply, sort of generally apply to residents. So that's green pricing which allows you to pay a little bit more each month to your utility to get RECs retired on your behalf. It's widely available. Competitive suppliers are basically the same thing, but it's utilities in a deregulated retail energy state. So there's 14 of those states. And you're not signing up with your incumbent utility. You're signing up with a third-party utility to get green energy. Um, then there's community solar, residents subscribing to and purchasing a portion uh, or purchasing a portion of an offsite solar garden. So it's kind of like a timeshare for rooftop solar but in a field. Um, 22 states have laws on the books allowing this, but um, so far really only four or five states are dominating the bulk, 75% um, plus of community solar signups because the, the how the policy is designed really makes or breaks whether or not a market can flourish. And then uh, community choice aggregation is in some states, uh, I guess 10, um, residents who live under a municipality who are now aggregating energy purchases for residents. Some of these CCAs exist to exceed the state requirements for green energy. Some CCAs come into place because they want to give their residents more choices, more options. Um, there's, there's really a lot of different reasons why CCAs are formed, but they, those also exist in 10 states. 
And it's also important to know that there's, there's shades of green. So um, you'll find out later, green, um, the Green Neighbor Challenge is focused, uh, at least at first, on green pricing, because one of the benefits is it's all rec-based. Um, we know it's green. Um, with these other products, is it, there's uh, the devil's in the details, often, in the policies and the contracts. Um, one thing NREL notes is most sales through most electricity products represent default rather than green power, particularly for community solar and competitive suppliers. A lot of this is because if, um, if you're in, say, the state of Minnesota, the law is such that all community solar gardens, the recs produced, all go to Excel because they are the grid operator and they use their lobbyists to write it into law to make sure that they got all the recs to meet the regulatory requirement with. Um, which isn't to say that it's a waste of time, far from it, um, especially since Excel is already above their renewable portfolio standard. There's benefit to getting more green um, energy on the grid. There's also the value of equity, you know, ownership and control. These are all important things not to lose sight of, but it is important, I think, to really understand that RECs are this, this legal ownership of the greenness, and we want to be advancing both supply and demand of renewables. And of course, um, there's also rooftop solar. Um, I don't wanna dive too deep into this, but there's a lot of reasons why rooftop solar doesn't work for a lot of people. And so I think it's important to really expand the menu. Environmentalists, um, I feel like it's always rooftop solar and EVs, rooftop solar and EVs. Well, you gotta have a lot of money and you gotta own a house and you gotta own a roof. And those are a lot of obstacles for a lot of people. What about the rest of us? And so that's kind of partly why I wanna raise the profile of some of these other solutions. Um, and I also just throw out there, Solar United Neighbors is a great, great uh, organization to work with. If you're interested in getting you and your neighbors, a lot, a bunch of your neighbors to engage on a rooftop solar co-op where you can bulk purchase the installation and the panels, save up to 30%, um, really great group. So in summary, you know, through rec markets, consumers can apply additional pressure alongside policy forces. Um, just kind of a key takeaway is it's not market versus policy, it can be both together. And so when we start to look at policy, um, the, energy, the energy system can be kind of thought on five, about five different layers. There's the community layer of the, I don't know, jump ahead to the next one, community layer with individuals, groups, institutions. There's the utility layer, um, and it depends what sort of utility are you under, investor owned, member owned co-op, municipally owned one. Um, then there's the municipal government, city, county, regional governments that have a really outside say in permitting and interconnection rights. Um, then there's the state level, which I think is actually probably the most powerful level in our energy system with legislatures, the Public Utility Commission, Public Service Commission, as well as the Departments of Revenue and Commerce often have um, power. And then there's the national ones. And I think these are, we put a lot of emphasis on these, probably too much emphasis on these, where we have very little control. And at least when it comes to energy, they haven't affected a whole lot of change. A lot of it comes from state policies, which then enable lower level municipal and utility decisions to be made. And I think we there's a lot of opportunity for upward force. Um, a quick little primer on utilities. So investor owned, there's not a lot of them, but they are the biggest ones. They're private utility companies. They're regulated usually by a public utilities commission or public service commission. And their focus is money for shareholders. They serve 72% of US residents. Then there's cooperatives. They're primarily rural. They're member owned. So that means if you get energy from a cooperative, you are part member owner of that cooperative. You have a right to go to the meetings. You have a right to have a say, um, to vote for, on decisions. And it's really important to get a lot more people involved. I think there was a study is less than 1% of cooperative member owners participate in decision-making processes. And then municipal, these are utility uh, utilities owned by local government and they're managed by local officials or employees. You can email them, you can call them, you can give them your opinions. Um, and the benefit is they, they optimize their benefits for local citizens. If we actually look at the top 10 utilities for green, um, Green pricing participation, eight of them are municipally owned. So really speaks to how um, cities can drive forward um, change. And so jumping into uh, 
policy levers. So as we start to, you know, this takes a long time. I wish I could go, this is a whole nother webinar unto itself to start to figure out your context. Um, but I wanna throw just a bunch of policy ideas out um, before passing this over to Lily, um, just to get folks thinking about what, what could be done to change things. Well, especially at the kind of local or state level. So first is climate action planning. Does your city or state have a climate action plan? Because they should. Does your business if it, you know, have a climate action plan? It should. You should be asking these questions, asking your managers, asking your representatives, why don't we have this? And if they don't have this, um, tell them they need to, or just write your own. And um, a great place to look is Solidarity. Solidarity um, has basically, they wrote a blueprint for their city. Um, I, and I, it was driven by community organizers, not by city officials, but they've got huge traction. Um, it's a really great document and a great source of inspiration because they really go beyond energy and they look at um, economy, jobs, justice. How do we transform really the whole economy of Highland Park uh, for the future? Because that's, that's really what we're talking about, transforming for the future. Second is community solar. Do you live in a state where community solar is possible? Well, try to get folks together, <laughs> aggregate demand, find a developer, get a community solar project built, or um, create a cooperative. So Cooperative Energy Futures is another power shift network group doing incredible work. They're a cooperative that sets up community solar, and they specifically work to make sure that those who could benefit most from community solar, from the economic benefits, from the jobs, that it is um, benefiting community directly. Um, there's also the really wonky thing here, I'll throw out the energy efficiency resource standard. If your state has one of those, it means utilities have incentives to drive energy efficiency. So that means that there's probably a lot more grants and incentives and energy efficiency programs available. If one is understand what exists, and get more people to, to use them. That's one, one approach. But also use the EERS as leverage to say, hey, you're not serving residents well enough. We want these other programs that can help people save energy, save money. Um, and so use the policy that exists uh, in your local context. Uh, another is um, similar to that, uh, LIHEAP, which is Low Income Heating and Energy Assistance Program as well as the weatherization assistance program. These are federal block grants administered by the states to help low-income folks both weatherize their homes and afford energy. Um, they, there's both a problem of, um, one is there's nowhere near enough funding for these programs to actually meet the need, but also there's still a lot of people who aren't aware that they exist. And so I think there's a need to one, help residents access these benefits, even if they may not receive help. Um, I think it, we need to bring more attention to the fact that these are underfunded. And part of that is, is um, you know, raising the public profile of these programs, um, because as you can see, is, there's a huge, huge need. This will nowhere, current funding comes nowhere close to um, helping us retrofit the homes that we need by 2050. Um, inclusive finance. This is um, one of the coolest policy ideas I've ever encountered in the energy space. The idea is, and this again, generally works in a state with EERS, get the utility to pay to improve homes through contractors. And so you can improve, um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, you can get energy efficiency improvements made in um, apartments, in condos, in basically what are known as split incentive uh, scenarios where you have a renter and you have a landlord. The renter pays the utility bills. The landlord owns the property and makes the decisions and usually makes the investments. But if you can get the uh, program in place where the utility will pay to improve the landlord's property and save the resident money at the same time, basically without having to do anything, um, it's, it's, it's to me really a sort of policy revolution. Um, and there's a great example. There's three states that have just implemented this not that long ago, and Community Power has done a uh, program in Minneapolis, a pilot that started in Minneapolis. So dig into these later. I think it's a really cool concept of how do we make energy efficiency accessible to everybody, even if they don't have access to capital. Community choice aggregation. If your state allows it, make use of it. I think it's, it's a great step in the direction of municipalization. 
Uh, municipalization, I think sometimes uh, it's easy for community organizers uh, to aim very high. It's, it's a thing that I think we wanna see more of over time, but um, Boulder, Colorado, I think offers a really cautionary tale of spending an entire decade fighting for municipalization, which was subjected to referendum after referendum after referendum. And actually the fourth referendum that the industry put up finally stopped the municipalization campaign in its tracks. So many things change. It eats up so much time. I think CCAs are a much less threatening way to start to put these capacities in local government. Um, also, um, for things that are really politically palatable in otherwise hostile communities, solar on schools. It's the biggest, you know, biggest parking lots, biggest roofs, um, and also one of the biggest utility costs that a local government has are usually the schools. Putting solar on schools, it, it both, it's financial good, it's kids, you know, you can do instruction education around it. Um, and then similarly, Brightfields is this concept of there are lots and lots of property that cities and counties have to deal with that are polluted, that can't be developed on, such as landfills, such as old industrial sites, et cetera. Turn these tax burdens into tax assets. You can put solar on um, these, these brown fields and you can pair them with regenerative plant life, even for example, to remediate soil, bring life back to the area. And so there's a lot of land out there that's not being used that is actually a burden that, that I think can be turned around. There's no shortage of land for us to build renewables on and find regenerative community-driven solutions. And then uh, Citizens Utility Board, this is essentially a ratepayers union. There's, uh, I know of at least three states with it, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin, I've linked them down here. The idea is people contribute money to basically fund a public watchdog. Sometimes that's through a state mandated energy tax, sometimes that's just voluntary dues, um, but, it's really powerful in addressing the asymmetry of like information and power that utilities have against residents. A citizens utility board can be a great resource for organizing community organization groups to get involved in public utility commission proceedings, understand the law of things and, and be more strategic in how we approach and understand what utilities are doing. And then lastly, I'll just kind of throw um, something, uh, an idea out that I haven't really seen put in place. There's been a lot of talks and implementations of utility shutoff moratoriums, um, but really I think I want to see more, this is sort of a challenge to organize this broadly. How do we define energy as a human right? Can we start to create energy systems where everybody's entitled to a minimum amount of energy to get through their day and make shutoffs entirely a thing of the past. It's, it's incredibly inhumane, incredibly disruptive, destroys lives when energy is disconnected. And there's not really a good reason for it because like the small amount of energy that's usually consumed by these homes is, is not the driving uh, the largest cost in the system. So just throwing that out there is something to think about. So in summary, energy systems are primarily defined between state and local levels. So there's a lot of opportunity for us to push change at the local level, build these relationships, build these capacities. And I think we, you know, we have to start building uh, local, deep local capacities, relationships and processes to achieve energy democracy. So um, little reflection point here is what opportunities do you see for greater collaboration between organizations and movements? And are there other clever or successful strategies that you've seen implemented locally? Other panelists? Also, I'll just say thank you for bearing with me. I feel like I was speeding up and speeding up and speeding up and I'm excited to breathe again. <laughs> Now I was going to let <clears throat> people who, uh, you know, worked specifically in this intersection um, go first, but since you all are being so kind to leave me the floor, 
Um, I will just say that as far as opportunities in regards to uh, collaboration between orgs and movements, right, to kind of combat these kind of dual access point issues, um, I'm hoping slash I see a future in which there is a unified point to understand how energy democracy, climate justice, racial justice, trans housing justice, you know, ecological justice are all different puzzle pieces of a larger puzzle that hopefully shows us liberation, right? That shows us accessible points um, for folks to ultimately be able to exist without having to sell their labor um, to justify being able to live in a certain area. Um, so I guess to make that a little bit more specified, my hope is to see climate justice being the kind of major um, justice movement that's catching a lot of media attention. The climate justice movement to do some of those building block works when it comes to uplifting and supporting energy democracy and other um, smaller offshoots where collaboration and material differences can actually be achieved for these communities instead of just focusing on larger projects and or um, larger senses of contribution around fighting climate change because as Kayla and you all have demonstrated so beautifully it starts here right you don't one of the um things that I love to talk about is like a lot of people see my tattoos and they're like oh that's wonderful did you just like go and get them done and I was like what do you mean? You don't just get a whole sleeve done in like one sitting, right? You don't just lose a whole bunch of weight in one workout. You don't just do one thing in one moment. Anything that takes any kind of time or build up or effort is going to take different pieces and different growing points. Um, but it also takes a starting point and a beginning. And I really see and have a lot of hope for the way that energy democracy and our larger climate justice movement integrate those beginning understanding points um, as a part of the roadmap for ultimate liberation and or you know liberatory aspects of politics. Yeah, thank you, Saren. Um was a great framing. Um, I think I'd like to uplift an organization that Andrew already has talked about, which is Cooperative Energy Futures. They're based um, in Minneapolis. Um, and I think one thing that really got me excited about energy cooperatives um, is I was, you know, I've been in like the nonprofit environmental space for a while. And I was very disheartened by our reliance on wealthy donors. And I heard about Cooperative Energy Futures paying out $600,000 to mostly indigenous activists fighting line three and other community groups. And that just made me so excited to think about how not only can it save your neighborhood money, you can also have a pot, a pot of money that then goes to fund further social change in the way that Saren was talking about, of like this money can be a way for communities to reclaim their wealth and then use that wealth to make further change in other areas. Um, that they deem necessary, whether that's like a community garden or fighting a pipeline. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and I think the other point that I think is very, or I guess, clever or successful strategies that I haven't seen coming out of cooperative energy futures is that they make a big effort to employ formerly incarcerated people for construction. And so I think they're specific, I mean, them and solidarity are often cited as organizations doing a really good job at not just like promoting energy savings, but being very strategic um, in social change in the process of creating the cooperative and what you do with that wealth. Um, yeah. And I think this may be the time where I uh, turn over screen sharing to Lily to take us out. All right, um, so let me just get mine shared. I have the same presentation here. Okay, so I'm gonna take over for, I'm still waiting for it to show up. Is it showing up for you guys? It's loading. Not quite yet. There it is. Okay, oh, so I'm gonna take over for, would you back up one slide for one second? Yes. Uh, I also forgot to show you there's 
oh backwards uh there's this great so when you get the slide deck there's this great list of i mean all the slides have links here's a bunch more links of some of the best resources out there yes thank you okay so now i'm gonna take 10 minutes probably to talk about the green neighbor challenge and what we're trying to do and how we sort of fit into the energy democracy landscape um, and then we'll open it up for the last 10 minutes um, for a final q a um, and then i'm also going to do a walkthrough of our uh, green pricing finder tool which we're still we're trying to get it ready for user testing. We're trying to push it over the finish line, um, but it's getting close. So you guys are gonna get a sneak preview. Um, so our vision is a world where our energy, energy economy improves public health, accelerates ecological restoration and strengthens community. And our guiding values are hope through collective action and community capacities for self-determination. Um, so the project, uh, it came out of Andrew's master's thesis, um, which is where he discovered through his research that 73% of homes have access to 100% green energy through their utilities. Um, but most people don't know about these programs. And actually, 100% of people have the ability to buy third party recs, which basically do the same thing as green pricing programs, um, where you can purchase like an equivalent amount of recs, which Andrew talked about earlier. Um, to certify your energy usage as green. Um, and these programs are usually pretty cheap. Um, they're obviously not accessible to everyone. As we already talked about, a third of homes are already energy burdened, so they can't necessarily afford to spend extra on green energy. But for the households that can, it's an opportunity to sort of have an impact on uh, the, the energy system. Um, and also, as, as Andrew talked about earlier, um, this drives more, like adds more renewables to the grid and um, displaces coal energy, so it has immediate health impacts. Um, so these, these green pricing programs that we started our focus on, um, they're accessible to 73% of households, but only 14% of people are aware that they exist. And that's because um, most of the time utility companies are, these programs are required to be revenue neutral, which means utility companies don't make a profit off of them. The cost of the program is just what it costs them to like buy, purchase those recs and administer the program. Um, but because the utilities don't make more money off of them, they don't have any incentive to like advertise and publicize them. Um, they sometimes make them hard to find or hard to sign up for on their on their websites, or they just sort of ignore them. Um, so what we're trying to do with Green Neighbor Challenge is um, we've created this uh, database of um, we're trying to do all of the active green pricing programs in the United States. Um, we've got a lot of them. Uh, I think we've got I forgot how like we can reach like 64% of households with our like research pro progress at this point, plus um, an option to buy RECs. So, um, but the, the purpose is for people to be able to easily find their, their own utilities green pricing program and sign up. Um, and so we're hoping to double enrollment from 2% to 4%. Maybe, hopefully we can go further than that, um, but, in any case, even just doubling from 2% to 4% would generate $953 million annually in public health savings. Um, it would provide a 45% boost to new wind and solar construction, construction um, and it would prevent as much carbon from being released as a forest the size of Maine could sequester, which we also know that the best climate action is like preventing carbon from being released instead of trying to sequester it after it's already in the atmosphere. <laughs> um, so we come in uh, with, with this tool, um, but we've sort of expanded beyond the idea of just green pricing. That's a first step. We know that individual market choices or like consumer action is not enough to transform systems. Um, so we are also working on designing these other tools to sort of move users along a continuum, continuum of change. So the first step is to find and sign up for green pricing. 
the next step is to challenge their friends and families to also go green um, and sign up for their problem, their programs um, and sort of get the conversation started around transitioning to green energy and um, energy options that people maybe don't know are available to them because their utilities don't make it obvious. Um, and then we're working on some other tools um, that can like a state letter maker that can help people learn about some of the policies that Andrew talked about earlier and write to their like state representatives, um, encouraging them to like implement these policies. And also an organization finder that we're working with PSN to, to build to help people find grassroots organizations near them to start really organizing around some of these issues and other, other issues that are like important to their communities and to their like ideas about um, what's important in the climate and energy movement. Um, and also some other like market resources like the ability to find energy efficiency um, incentive resources in their state to help improve the energy efficiency of their houses um, or add rooftop solar or join a community solar garden if that's an option for them. So just helping move people along these other ways to sort of get involved in the energy, energy system um, and movements around that. So uh, now I'm gonna demonstrate the site. Um, I've got it open. So this is our beta site. Um, we're still, there's still some bugs and some things that we're working on um, fixing aesthetically and functionally. Um, so just a heads up about that. Um, but you are free to go to greenneighborchallenge.org to try it out yourself. Um, we're not ready to share it out widely yet um, because it still is in beta testing mode, but we would love it if you went and tried it out. Find your program if there's one available and like you're learning how to sign up for green energy yourself. And also please send us some feedback using this little feedback button um, and, oops, and tell us about anything that you run into on the site that um, needs to be fixed or you think we can improve somehow. So I'm gonna move my Zoom stuff out of the way here. When you go to the site, the first thing you do is just um, put in your zip code and then it should bring up your utility company. So my company is Excel and I can see that they have two different green pricing programs here. Um, and so we have information about the breakdown of the energy. This one has 22% solar and 78% wind, um, which you can also see here. Um, we have information about the cost. So we've got net cost in um, price per kilowatt hours, but that's probably sort of meaningless to most people because you don't know how many kilowatt hours you use per month, um, which is why we've also added over here this estimate based on average usage um, in like a one bedroom apartment or a three bedroom house, I believe is how we calculated that. And like based on regional energy uses, usage also, um, we estimated how much it would in increase your average monthly energy bill. So this Renewable Connect is a little bit more expensive. It's also waitlisted, which I know, and I don't think that's showing up on here right now, but um, wind source is open and it's a bit cheaper as well. Um, I know that I'm signed up for it and I think I pay less than $2 a month because um, I live in an apartment and don't use a ton of energy. Um, and then we've also got this explanation of the different pricing options. You can either match a percentage of your energy use um, or you can buy fixed energy blocks and that's just paying for the same amount of green energy every month um, that's not necessarily tied to your individual energy use. Um, we also have information about like whether the programs are certified. So Green E is um, a program managed by the Center for Resource Solutions. And it basically indicates that this is the highest industry standard for green energy and a green pricing program. And then the renewable energy credits are again, the RECs that Andrew talked about, which certifies that you actually are getting green energy um, and that recs are retired on your behalf so no one else can claim that green energy. And so it's just a, like a certification that you're actually getting what you paid for. Um, there's a little bit more information about 
what the price means and what you need to be able to sign up. Um, and if you look up your utility company and there's not a program available or you don't like the option that you see, um, you can also purchase unbundled recs, which we talked about um, that do pretty much the same thing um, where you can uh, calculate the amount of energy you use and then buy recs to certify that amount of energy as green in your name. Um, and it has basically the same effect. Um, but the option that we have for that is through BEF, the Bonneville Environmental Foundation, and that's a nonprofit in Oregon. They're also Green E certified, so it's a pretty high quality product that we trust. But also be careful because when you go to their website, they also sell carbon offsets that are not the same thing as Rex, and they're not. I don't want to get started on offsets, but they're not great. <laughs> um, they're not great climate action. Um, Let's see. Oh, also, if you're in one of the like deregulated retail energy market states, there is a different sort of process that we haven't pushed out onto the website yet because I think it made it crash the last time we tried it, but that's coming soon. So you might not see all of your options if you're in like Texas or um, some parts of New York, but uh, that's coming soon. We're in beta. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and show what happens when we click on select. Um, so you can click, you can go to the program FAQs on the website. Um, it's loading. There it is. Or you can look and uh, find contact information uh, for the utility and for the program specifically, if that's available. You can ask them more questions um, if something isn't covered in the FAQs. Um, or you can hit go to sign up. Um, it's going to ask me to log in and I'm already signed up. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to head back to here. I'm going to say, yes, I was able to sign up. And we, we get to this final page. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter here, or you can also share um, on social media and say, I just signed up for green energy using the Green Neighbor Challenge tool and challenge your friends and contacts to do the same. Um, which I'm also not going to do right now because our tool isn't live, but um, that's the idea in theory. Um, once we launch, we're really going to push people to share it on social media um, because, you know, one person paying for, you know, 100 kilowatts of Rex is not really going to make much of an impact on the energy system. But if we can get more people to share it out and start having these conversations about energy and start getting a lot of people signed up, that's when it really starts to like get to a tipping point where like you are driving demand for more renewables on the grid. Oh no, I'm running out of time. Okay, I just wanna say, uh, we also have this menu here. Um, these are some of the tools that are still in development that we're, we're working on adding that will help like uh, teach people more about like policies and um, organizing around the energy system. And also finding the things like uh, energy efficiency incentives and um, like uh, energy bill assistance, the LIHE program. Um, there's also a tip jar if you want to donate and support our work. Um, there's an About Us page that has some FAQs about the tool and um, about us. And um, I'm forgetting if I have anything else that I need to cover, but we're, we're low on time. So I'm gonna actually, can I pass it back to you, Andrew? Cause I accidentally closed the presentation. Yes. Um, and I don't know where I'm going. How am I going? Near the, the there it is. We basically want to, um, yeah, I mean, there's ways to support ways, um, links in our thing that we'll send out, but would love to, I think, get to questions here. <laughs> and I saw we had, um, yeah, a question. Um, I don't know if that got broadcasted. Kyle had asked about um, Arcadia Power. If you don't have an option, Arcadia Power is, a, I think, a decent option. There's, there's, they're not Greeny certified. So it's not the highest quality recs um, necessarily, but um, we have talked to them in the past about working together. Um, they, they, to their benefit, I think their app is great. They make it very easy to do, and it gives you more insights 
into your energy usage, which is also great and like empowering, providing more knowledge. But I do feel conflicted about the fact that there's like a virtual middleman that needs to exist in that space. Um, and I know uh, Kayla had also highlighted, there was a question way back in the chat about um, health insurance companies and whether or not they're doing anything. Um, I, I think there's um, some, I mean, the health the healthcare space is such an interesting space, having a division between insurance companies and hospitals providers. Um, there are a lot of providers doing uh, transitioning to renewables. I don't think it's happening fast enough. And I think, you know, as Maria was bringing up, um, insurers are actually investing in housing because there's a return on investment in, in safe, secure housing. Um, I've been trying, I've actually had some conversations at a few different um, insurers trying to raise this, like you could actually save money in your community if you forced all your providers to sign up for 100% green energy, because right now your hospitals are buying energy that are making the community sick. And so um, I think that's a conversation that's just starting to emerge um, and really hasn't taken flight in the industry yet. I just wanna say thanks to everybody for sticking with us this long. I know this is late on a Thursday night and a lot of things thrown at you. Sarah. I was just going to say the same thing, Andrew. I was also going to say that um, we'll be sending up a follow-up email to everyone who registered for this wonderful um, webinar, as well as making sure that all the ways that you can access Green Neighbor Challenge that were shown in this uh, slide deck will also be added to the follow-up email so that if folks weren't able to write things down in the nick of time, don't worry, don't hesitate. We'll be making sure that our follow-up email has all the resources folks could need. We love to hear folks really appreciating the work that we've come together to do. But more than anything, thank you, Andrew and Lily, for partnering with the PowerShift Network to talk about something so important such as energy democracy.